Timothy argues in the book, uh, not merely theoretically, but also provides a framework as to how we can think about free speech in a globally connected world. For anyone interested in the subject of free speech, I believe that this is, this is required reading because it's both theoretical as well as ha has, has, has really interesting practical application in the world in which we live in. And this is a world where we both have un, as an unprecedented amounts of free speech as well as unprecedented restrictions on free speech. Uh, and given the fact that India has to play a key role in this global struggle for free speech, we thought that it would be useful if on the other side we have Gautam Bhatia, for, as a not in terms of a debate, but certainly in terms of providing a perspective uh, on India's role in this global struggle for, again, for free speech. And uh, Gautam is a, is a lawyer, is an advocate uh, based in Delhi, as in he is an alumnus of the National Law School and has completed his BCL and MPhil at Oxford and then the LLM at Yale. Uh, I sometimes forget the number of degrees that he has acquired and will go on to acquire, I'm certain. But most importantly today, as in Gautam, is the author of the book of End Shock and Dis or Disturb, which is, I, I believe, as in the first and perhaps the most authoritative work on free speech that has been written in India. So Gautam is going to present us with a perspective of what free speech in India looks like as in whether it is really free or it's unfree, and how free speech in India interacts with uh, other rights that may be there in the Constitution. So the format that we are going to follow is essentially, uh, we're going to have opening remarks for our speakers for about 10 minutes, uh, and then we're going to have a bit of a moderated chat, and we'll have questions from the floor thereafter. So that should leave us plenty of time uh, for everyone to have their questions in, as well as to have a discussion on the subject of India's role in the global struggle for free speech. So without any further ado, please welcome Timothy Ghatanash. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm hugely impressed with what you're doing in the Viti uh, Institute altogether, um, what Agya Sengupta and his colleagues are doing, um, and also immensely impressed by Gautam Bhatia's book, which I recommend to anyone who by any remote chance has not yet bought it and read it. <laughs> now, I should start with a massive disclaimer. I am a contemporary historian, a specialist in international relations. I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, a lawyer. I'm a historian who's fallen among lawyers uh, because of my work on free speech. I'm also not an expert on India, so I'm doubly disqualified from speaking on this panel. Nonetheless, I will. Um, so my work on free speech, which I've been conducting for the last 10 years, simply because I regard free speech as so important as the oxygen of all other freedoms, uh, the freedom on which all other freedoms depend. Um, and I think it's under threat in many places, including, by the way, in the West, classically conceived, has taken me to look at the legal literature, which is superb. It is a really great pleasure to read, particularly the English language in the broadest sense, literature on free speech and law. The great law review articles are classics. They're superb explorations also of culture, history, philosophy. It goes deep into philosophy, anthropology, sociology. But there is one problem with this literature, which is inevitably it works, so to speak, at the difficult frontiers uh, of free speech. Um, I argue that there are two key questions to ask about free speech. The first is how free should speech be? The second is how should free speech be? That is to say, within the realm that the law allows us to speak, how should we interact? And the norm I propose there is a norm of robust civility not just civility, but robust civility, so we manage to speak about very difficult and controversial matters, but in ways that ensure that we don't come to blows, that civility is preserved. So the first question, how free should speech be, is the classic lawyer's question, right? And it's answered in the, in the realm of law. The second is more in the realm of norms, 
And I gather, correct me if I'm wrong, that one possible understanding of the Sanskrit word viti is norms, yes, or what we would call norms, so this is very appropriate for the viti dialogue. So there's the kingdom of law and the republic of norms, I argue. And the question is, what is the relation between these two? And clearly in a society where you have strong norms of robust civility, as traditionally we've had in, say, Britain or Germany today, you have less need for the intervention of law, right? So the two are connected in complex and interesting ways, the kingdom of law and the republic of norms. Now, this book is about the unprecedented world to which you briefly alluded in your introduction, and this world is created by something I bet all of you have in your pocket or handbag. Is there anyone here who doesn't? Very few, I think. The smartphone gives you the opportunity, completely unprecedented in human history, to communicate instantaneously with something close to half of humankind. There has never been such an opportunity for free speech in human history, but with that opportunity come enormous risks, right? Threats, abuse, bullying, harassment, incited, incitement, uh, which is then acted upon, and so on and so forth. So when the authors of the UN Declaration of Human Rights wrote in the great Article 19 the, 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 the phrase, regardless of frontiers. This was a visionary phrase. It was almost science fiction. Now it has become reality through the internet and the smartphone. And in this world, I argue, this connected world, which I call cosmopolis, our effective freedom of speech is no longer determined primarily by the state in which you live which is, so to speak, the classic framing of discussions about free speech. We're in the United States, so we have the First Amendment, Supreme Court rulings, that's it. In this connected world, our effective freedom of speech is determined by four forces. Firstly, a growing number of international organizations, treaties, and networks, formal and informal, notably those on internet governance as well as international courts. Secondly, the states. Uh, the cyber libertarians of the 1990s were completely wrong. The internet does not set you free. And the proof of that is in China. In the year 2000, Bill Clinton said, for China to try to control the internet is like trying to nail jello to the wall. And the Chinese Communist Party turned around and said, Bill, just watch us. And you know what? In the last 15 years, they've made a pretty bloody good stab at nailing Jello to the wall. With, by the way, the largest apparatus of censorship in human history. But they've, they're pretty well succeeding at the moment. What is more, they are spreading their norm of information sovereignty around the world. So that's the states. The third big force is what I call the private superpowers. Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Apple, and other major players, what the French call rather angrily, les GAFA, les GAFA. This also is unprecedented in human history because what something like Facebook with 1.8 billion regular monthly users, bigger than China if it were a country, provides is a privately owned global public sphere. So that the terms of our freedom of speech on Facebook are being determined, obviously to some extent, by the, 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 the state in which you live, as in the famous Baltakare case in, in Mumbai, right, where the two people who posted on Facebook, but also by private editorial, community standards, you could say private censorship. But those decisions of Facebook, for example, on nudity, are private, non-transparent, non-accountable, and non-appealable. So that they're everything we think decisions should not be in a rule of law country. And this is a major issue in how we engage with the private superpowers. 
and of course the Indian market is very important to them. The fourth force is us. So I say the governments are the big dogs, the companies are the big cats, we're the mice, we're the little mice. And we may feel very powerless in the face of such big dogs and big cats, but the evidence is that networked mice, when the mice get together, the big dogs and the big cats take, fries, take fright. And I can give you several instances of this. So don't despair. Networked mice, it gives new opportunities for social pressure. Now, the point is, if we are in such a world where the determinant of the effective of reach is not just the state, then approaching this from the point of view of law is only one part of the story. And necessarily, in every single case, you're talking about a different legal tradition. So what Hartam does very effectively is to compare a number of legal traditions within, roughly speaking, the Anglosphere liberal constitutional tradition. Um, but then there's Germany, and then there's France, and then there's China, and then there are many other countries. So my, the fundamental move in my book uh, is to say, we therefore have to move to the level of viti, of norms, and first work out, in the simplest, clearest possible terms, what our underlying principles are, what the norms are that we want to realize in respect of, say, privacy, in respect of religion, in respect of violence, in respect of national security, all the key issues and then come to the question, how do we actually realize that? Is it more important that we go after Facebook? Or is it more important we go after our national government? Or is it the Internet Engineering Task Force? Which is the key actor in this field, or which two actors? Hence the key move to the set of ten principles which are laid out in this book and on our website, freespeechdebate.com. This is an Oxford University website. It's in 13 languages, including Hindi. I would strongly encourage you all to come and visit the website, freespeechdebate.com, and look at the fantastic material which is on there, case studies, arguments, analyses, and the 10 principles. Now, I'm not going to go through them all, because that will take more than 10 minutes, but I'm just going to mention a couple. The first is our reformulation, and then come to India. So the first is our reformulation of Article 19 in a simplified form, we all human beings must be free and able to express ourselves and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas regardless of frontiers. Now the key addition is the word and able. In the spirit of Amartya Sen and the capabilities approach that he pioneered, we say the rural poor in India who are illiterate, have not the necessary education or internet access, do not enjoy freedom of speech and freedom of information. Pretty self-evident point. Just as the beggar is not free to dine at the Ritz, even if he has the theoretical right to dine at the Ritz. So we've added the word and able, which I think is pretty important. The second principle, which I hope we can talk about, because it's really crucial, is about violence. And it says, we neither make threats of violence nor accept violent intimidation. And the crucial point is the addition of the second part, which is as important as the first. So in every liberal uh, jurisdiction, you have uh, the, 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 the prohibition of direct incitement to violence, right, including in the United States. But we add, as of equal importance, not accepting violent intimidation. Because what is certainly happening alarmingly in Western Europe, and I, I fear, I mean, you'll talk about this, but I fear it's rather familiar in India too, is a growing acceptance of violent intimidation. So by analogy with the famous heckler's veto, I have coined the phrase the assassin's veto, right? That is people saying, if you say that or publish that, we will kill you. Great example the murder of the journalist and cartoonist of Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Okay, now the effect of that is not just the murder of the journalist of Charlie Hebdo, it is a wide-reaching, chilling effect exercised by the assassin's veto. Self-censorship out of fear on matters relating to Islam 
uh, is quite widespread in Western Europe now. For me, I mean, now, by the way, each principle then has a substantial 50-page chapter with much argument, sinewy argument, and many case studies, importantly drawn also from outside the classical West. We made to, went to great efforts to get examples from India, from China, from the Middle East. So, so read it. Um, but um, for me, those two are absolutely crucial. And in a sense, if one could achieve acceptance of those two, we can argue till the cows come home about all the rest, okay? Let me just mention the one on religion, and then I'll go quickly to India. On religion, it says, and you can imagine how hard we worked on these, and by the way, this is a product of 10 years, not just research and thinking, but also of a transcultural debate. So I actually came to China, I came to Egypt, and I came to India in 2013, as some of you will know, to discuss an earlier draft of these principles. So this is already the product of a transcultural debate, and it's, it's a draft for discussion. It's little, certainly not the last word. But my proposal for religion is we respect the believer, but not necessarily the content of the belief. So the distinction is between my unconditional recognition respect for you as a believer and my only conditional appraisal respect for the content of the belief. I need hardly point out to you this is somewhat different from what has, I think it's fair to say, traditionally been done in India. When I presented this to a group of Indian MPs, the Ten Principles, they said, oh, all the rest are absolutely fine, no problem with that at all, but they all literally jumped up and down, and I mean jumped up and down and shouted at me on this one. Hindu, Sikh, Muslim, secular, they said, you can't do that in India. But then when I said why, it became very interesting, because then two different lines of argument emerged. One was fundamental. This principle makes no sense. It is incoherent. It is a contradiction in terms. You cannot respect me as a believer unless you respect my belief. Respect me, respect my belief, respect my belief, respect me. The other line of argument was, look, in principle, I think you're correct. This should be the liberal basis for a free multicultural society. But we can't do that in India yet because we're coming from such a different place that people will be burning down shops in no time. I mean, I, I simplify slightly. but So we want to move in. The, now, you will see that those two arguments take you in completely different directions. With one, there is no way forward. With the latter argument, there is a way forward. This brings me to why I think India is a swing street, swing state for global free speech. So simplifying crudely, if you look at the big players in the debate about free speech, you have over here North America and Europe, which differ in many important respects, for example, about hate speech, but broadly speaking are advocating a set of liberal norms. Over here you have China, which is advocating a totalitarian control and the norm of information sovereignty, and spreading that norm quite effectively to Africa and to Latin America and elsewhere in Asia. And in between you have a group of swing states, South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia and Turkey in the Muslim world, both very important. And in my view, and I don't just say that because I'm in India, the biggest and most important of them all is India because of its size, because of its growing economic strength and power, because of its extraordinary strength in the IT sector, so that in questions relating to internet governance, for example, India is a major player and because of its regional role. I just did a debate at the Jaipur Literary Festival with writers from Bangladesh, Korea, and Nepal. And they were saying, we all look to India. If things go wrong in India, that's bad for us and us making the case for free speech. So certainly it's regional role. India is also so crucial because of all the countries I mentioned, it has in many ways the strongest traditions of free speech. And now I'm talking to you about your own history, but let me say it very briefly from the view of an ignorant outsider. First of all, the great traditions of Indian civilization and culture. So if you look in the index of my book, you have Ashoka, 
Akbar all the way to Gandhi and Ambedkar. And, and I'm not just flattering you when I say it is genuinely fascinating, this tradition, just to give one point. From the 12th Edict of Ashoka all the way to Gandhi, there's a really unusual emphasis, which you don't find so much in the Western literature, not just on the good speaker, but on the good listener. I'm going to mangle the Sanskrit word, but bahusruta, bahusruta, the state of being the perfect listener. So there's a genuinely original emphasis on the listener and the qualities of the good listener, not just the speaker. At the same time, you have this great tradition of liberal constitutionalism, democracy, and independent courts. And judgments like the recent Supreme Court judgment on 66A of the IT Act are great judgments. There are also, as Gautam points out, some other judgments which are not so great. And here I'm getting to the point where I'm going to hand over to you. On the other hand, you have, and for me as an Englishman, I have to say it's rather a shocking experience, the colonial legacy of all these overbroad provisions in the Indian Penal Code with which I've become familiar, 124A, which is fascinating to hear, was introduced in 80, 1870, I learned this from you, because of the rise of Wahhabi political activism. Yeah. Remember that, we're still talking about it now, 295A, 153A, and so on. And what it's like for me as a sort of modern liberal Englishman is like seeing our own past in a distorting mirror. Because there you have, you know, the worst of sort of English uh, 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 colonial law and actually our own past, because we had the sedition provisions until quite recently being misused, used, misused in India. In addition to which, you have the assassin's veto, the heck, heckler's veto, and what I call the third veto, the I'm offended veto, which is a kind of minor version. Yeah, you, you laugh. I mean, we have it too in British universities and American universities. And so you have visibly to the world this battle going on also inside India. You have people like Argyan Khautam valiantly fighting the good fight in the tradition of of the great Soli Sarabji, who I'm delighted to see here with us today, um, a great figure in, in, in the fight for free speech in India, but you also have these countervailing forces. And I'm, with this, I'm coming to the end, but let me just say, to come back to my starting point, I have asked everyone I've met over the last two weeks in India, which way do you think it's going? crudely put in India? Is it getting better or worse? Is there an erosion? And I've actually got very different answers. And the different answers, to some extent, depend on whether you're looking at the legal erosion, uh, the bad judgments that you've been writing about so eloquently, or whether, on the other hand, you're looking at the social reality, where what Amartya Sen called the argumentative Indian seems to be in fine health and fine voice, I would have to say. Uh, so that, you know, it's interesting if you broaden the picture from the law to look at the social reality, and then there are the intermediate areas. For example, if you take the media and journalism, on which I have a long chapter, we have a principle. It's not exactly law, except at the margins, but nor is it simply social practice. It's something in between where you have elements of regulation, but you also have business models, business practices, paid news, dare I mention it as a bad practice, technology, which plays an enormous role, the things you can get on your smartphone, and the journalistic ethos, if there is still such a thing, the ethics of journalists. Does that sound exotic? Um, but it's an important part of, of the, the media you need for free speech and democracy. So there are these areas, which I hope we can talk about, which are actually somewhere in between, so to speak, the kingdom of law and the republic of norms. That is what I wanted to say in introduction to set the big picture. As I say, I speak as someone who's come with deep ignorance and humility to learn. One of the great things Gandhi said in a speech, in actually in London in 1931, was we have to find ways of speaking that open ears, the emphasis on the listener again, it's a wonderful phrase. 
I can assure you I am all open ears and I look forward to the debate. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Timothy. I think there's a, there's a lot to chew on there, both in terms of some very provocative principles, and uh, which I'm sure we can get to when we are um, in the question and answer session, and also a very elegant framing of the issue as to who controls free speech and, and how is, uh, how free speech should be and both how should free speech be, as in both critical questions. Um, given that Timothy mentioned that India is a swing state, uh, you think it, it would be good to recognize as to what's happening in India as far as practice of free speech is concerned, both in the courts as well as free speech vis-a-vis -vis other rights, whether in the courts or outside it. Uh, so I hand over to Gautam uh, for his brief opening remarks. Thanks. Um, so I think uh, a good place to start would be an example that would be familiar to most of us. I think most of us would have seen the film uh, Jolly LLB and would have enjoyed its quite sharp and satirical take on the Indian legal profession. Now, Jolly LLB 2 is, is, has just been made, and last week a PIL was filed in the Bombay High Court asking the High Court to order the filmmakers to remove the LLB from the film title and also to stop the trailers from being shown on, shown on social media because apparently there's a scene in the movie where lawyers are uh, playing cards and dancing in the court premises, and as we all know, we lawyers just don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that PIL was filed, and uh, my reaction when I read about that was one of trepidation, uh, because given a lot of what's gone down in the last few months, it would not be entirely unsurprising if the court was to pass some kind of an order on that. And I think that is something that shows you that we aren't living in precisely normal times with respect to the judiciary and free speech. Now, I don't want to overstate the case. Uh, the Indian judiciary has historically had a very ambivalent relationship with free speech. So the courts have upheld pretty much all the colonial speech restricting provisions in the IPC, including sedition, blasphemy, the book banning provisions of the CRPC, and criminal defamation. The courts have also upheld post-independence laws that were explicitly mirrored on colonial laws like the Press Act of 1951 and uh, film censorship, which again mirrored the colonial provisions. Uh, now, you do have the odd exceptions, such as the Shreya Single Judgment recently, and indeed even last month, Delhi High Court had a very interesting and progressive judgment on intermediary liability. But these remain exceptions. More broadly, the judiciary has tended to favor the restriction over the right. Now, but even then, in all these cases that I mentioned, you still have the courts acting as constitutional courts, which is that you have a law that has been passed by parliament or has been implicitly acceded to by virtue of continuing from colonial times. Someone challenges the law on the basis that it violates the right to free speech, and the court decides. You might disagree with the court's decision, but it's still acting as the constitution envisages it uh, and intended it to act. But Cases like the Jolly LLB, and which have begun uh, in recent times, are a little more disturbing. Um, and the genesis of, of this, I think, is around 11 years ago in a case called Inri Noise Pollution, uh, where the Supreme Court decides that the right to free speech must be balanced against the right to noise-free environment, and then decides to pass some guidelines about you know when can you play loudspeakers and so on. That then morphs into a case called Kamle Shwaswani, which I'm guessing most of you have heard about, where Kamle Shwaswani, uh, a lawyer, uh, decides to file, uh, file a petition. And this the petition is a thing of beauty, you should read it. Uh, he says that because there is no law to regulate pornography, the Supreme Court should command the parliament to make a law. And he says things like, porn is worse than potassium cyanide and things like that. Now you'd expect that something so frivolous would be dismissed out of hand with heavy costs, but no, uh, it's been going on for three years and you have uh, multiple hearings where the court starts asking the, the government, look, can you block porn sites? How can you do it? Maybe you should consider taking a list of names and blocking them. Right? And the important thing here is that, that there's no law that exists that, uh, that, that, that regulates this, but the court itself is taking the lead and saying that we will decide that this area of speech is bad, and then we will decide how uh, it will be regulated. 
and this is not just uh, the Supreme Court, it's not just one judge. Uh, you had the, the Madras High Court uh, uh, last year on the PIL commanding that the epic Thirukural be taught in schools. You had the Meghalaya High Court the year before that gagging the media from reporting on buns. Uh, recently, the Supreme Court uh, asked the uh, additional solicitor general about what can be done about explicit pictures on condom packets. Uh, and uh, you also had a pretty bizarre case where a gang rape happened in, in Uttar Pradesh. A politician said this is a political controversy. The Supreme Court was outraged. It framed four questions. The first question was that, is our politicians allowed to say such things? And, uh, and, and that, again, I think shows you how far we have come. And of course, you have a case recently, which is sub judice, so I can't talk about it. But you all know which case I'm talking about. <laughs> right? um, and uh, now, the, the issue uh, with these cases is not simply that that the outcomes are bad, but what the court is doing is unconstitutional. Uh, and that's something that we should be clear about because our objections to what the court is doing should be grounded in, in what is legally wrong. Right? Now, Article 19.1a guarantees the right to free speech. 19.2 states that uh, speech can be restricted only if the state makes a law. Right? Uh, it is well established uh, by a constitution meant to the Supreme Court in Rupa Ashok Hura following a nine judge bench the judiciary is not state for the purposes of Article 19. So the judiciary can't do this. Secondly, it's also well established from the 60s that law in 19.2 means a law enacted by parliament. Uh, and therefore, again, a judicial order does not constitute law for the purpose of this article. So basically, when the Supreme Court, in the absence of an existing law, decides to regulate or restrict speech, it is going completely beyond the bounds of the Constitution. And this isn't simply a technicality. There's a principle behind this. And that is that the Constitution sets up a two, tier, two tiers of safeguards for civil rights. At the first tier, you have the parliament, which will meet, deliberate, and decide, and then pass a law if it deems that a certain area of speech should be regulated. Then, if you have an objection to that, you move the courts, and the courts decide if it's, uh, if it's constitutional. What is happening now is that the courts are bypassing this by taking upon themselves the task of sua moto regulating speech. Uh, and so now what you have is just this, that any one petitioner somewhere in the country can decide to file a PIL. All he or she needs to do is to find one judge who shares that prejudice with, with him or her. And next morning, you wake up and you'll find that this entire area of law is now uh, speech is out, out of bounds. Right? And so I think that's something very dangerous and unprecedented. And we need to also modulate our response to that effect. So we can't simply be be saying that the outcomes in these cases are bad. The Supreme Court is, is restricting speech. We also have to go back to the basics, talk about separation of powers, talk about jurisdiction, and say the Supreme Court cannot do this. It does not have the power to do this. Right? And that's something that's presently, I think, missing from, from our critique of the Supreme Court. Right? So that's, um, I mean, broadly the, fir the first point on uh, free speech presently um, uh, in, in the Indian courts. Now, secondly, uh, I want to talk about something that I think also has relevance to what Professor Ash talked about, which is uh, some Indian laws uh, regulate speech in the interests of other constitutional values. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at these laws in the abstract, you'll find a pretty straightforward violation of free speech. But if you think about them in the social and historical context of India, the picture is a little more complicated. Uh, and the three laws, I think, which bring this home sharply one is the recently passed Maharashtra Prevention of Social Boycotts Act. The second is the Sati Prevention Act. And the third is the Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes, Prevention of Atrocities Act. In the Maharashtra Social Boycott Act, Prevention of Social Boycott Act, you have a wide variety of legal measures that seek to prevent social boycotts. And they include speech restrictions, for example, uh, inciting an individual to break off social relations with another member of the community. Right? The Sati Prevention Act prohibits the glorification of Sati, so clear speech restriction. And the Scheduled Caste, Scheduled Tribes Act prevents the intentional insulting and humiliate, humiliation of members of Scheduled Caste and Scheduled Tribes. Now, for example, if you take the social boycott law, uh, it seems a, a pretty clear restriction of free speech. But then if you think about the fact that, that you cannot separate calls for boycott or the speech acts that uh, result in asking people to boycott others, and the entire gamut of social practices that have historically resulted in discrimination and subordination in our society. And it's interesting that, that Ambedkar, uh, in the book, What Congress and Gandhi Have Done to the Untouchables, in, in chapter four, he 
talks about this specifically and he frames a civil rights law uh, and at the heart of his civil rights law is an anti-boycott provision and he, he argues that if you look at how we have been going all these years what happens is that that uh, Dalits are not allowed to use the public public pathways, Dalits cannot use the, the common wells uh, and cannot pray in temples and therefore you need to have a strong law that protects their civil rights by outlawing this form of discrimination. Now can you separate or cleanly distinguish between the practices of boycott and the calls for boycott right? and, and that's something we have to think about closely. Uh, and of course other scholars not in India have discussed this, Jeremy Waldron in his treatment of hate speech uh, talks about how um, what hate speech does is create an atmosphere or, or a climate in which certain uh, members of society uh, are uh, simply are excluded from speaking, are excluded from participating on equal terms. Right? And similarly in the Sati Prevention Act, again you have to ask yourself, can you separate the glorification of Sati from an entire history of structural and institutional violence against women and similarly with the Scheduled Caste Scheduled Tribes Act. Uh, we haven't yet begun to have these conversations. In fact, the only judicial conversation on this, in fact, is by Justice Markande Karju, who for all his controversies, I think, does get this right when he, in a judgment on the Scheduled Caste Scheduled Tribes Act, uh, compares using the word chamar to using the word nigger and says that, look, uh, you have to place this word, this speech act, in the context of the hierarchies that have sustained uh, Indian society for so long and therefore if you think about this speech act as not simply speech but a practice or as an act then it becomes much more complicated. So that's a conversation that I think that we need to have uh, when we're talking about free speech, violence and other constitutional values that that uh, that uh, relate between between these, 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 these issues. Um. Thanks, Gautam. As in, I think that paints a, 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 a more sobering picture about free speech in India, um, especially on the role of courts. So since we, as in Gautam, briefly touched upon the question of the role of courts, I was wondering, Timothy, whether I, I could just kickstart this. You laid out four sort of key players in this framework of, free sp of the future of free speech, uh, international NGOs, states, private superpowers, and the people, essentially. Uh, the courts are obviously a part of the state, but given the critical role that they have, almost a, a bellwether role as in, in, in the Indian context, in terms of ensuring how speech being free, do you think there's room for the, to see the courts as a fifth category, or perhaps do you see it as an appendage to each of the four in different ways? No, I think that uh, courts are definitely part of the state. Uh, that, I mean, in, in the American system, as you all know, they're actually part of the government. The executive, the legislature, and the judiciary are three arms of government. So I don't think one could see them as separate in that sense. Um, what there is, however, and this we haven't touched on, is a growing number of international courts with a growing amount of uh, significant jurisprudence so that in the European context, we are not sitting in our own national houses referring only to our own constitutional courts. The constant reference is to the Strasbourg Court, the European Court of Human Rights, um, uh, even in Britain, I should say. Um, at least until Brexit, and I, I hope even after Brexit. Um, so that I think that is, and, and after all, we who believe in uh, developing and uh, thickening liberal international order, one of the key areas in which we want to see it thickened is international humanitarian law, and therefore one had hoped to see the emergence. Now, actually, in, Latin Amer in the Americas, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights is... is non-negligible. I mean, it's not as effective, but it did. We have a case study on freespeechdebate.com where I think it was in Chile, uh, a, a ruling of that court resulted in a change to the Constitution. So that I, I, I think, you know, one would like to see. Now, of course, in the Asian context, correct me if I'm wrong, there's nothing remotely comparable. Yeah. But, so, Gautam, just, just to take that forward, given the fact that, as in it's the role that courts play, um, is critical, as in to the way in which free speech is practiced, uh, not just for the function of what law they laid down, but also for the symbolic uh, So where do you see the role of the Supreme Court 
keep the discourse around free speech in India going forward. Because we are in an environment apart from you know, as of the fact that we everyone has smartphones, so we are in an age of unrestricted free speech in some sense, or or, or the capacity for unrestricted free speech. At the same time, as in we've had as many restrictions as could possibly be seen, including ones uh, in, in the manner uh, in which you pointed out through the PILs. So where do you, where do you see this going in terms of the in terms of uh, the court as an institution and the I think that's uh, the court's function is at least as, as much symbolic as actually echo judgment and as we all know court judgments especially on civil rights are, are often unimplemented but what the especially now what the court is saying often gets picked up uh, immediately by the media and, and I have noticed this uh, in court that uh, a judge will say something off the cuff, you say something that in the heat of a, of a debate with a lawyer and within two minutes you have that all over the electronic media, out of context, so it will look much worse than it actually is. Uh, so that's... I've got an interesting interrupt you once there, do you think that plays against your norm of uncensored but trustworthy media? That's one of the principles of Timothy is out, we want an uncensored media but trustworthy one. Here it seems to be a case of an uncensored media that creates an untrustworthy so the and then uh, these may sound banal, but we worked very hard on these three adjectives, three adjectives to describe the media you need for a well-functioning liberal democracy are uncensored, diverse, and trustworthy. Uncensored is obvious. Diverse means diversity of ownership, diversity of medium, diversity of representation, so different ethnic groups, different social groups, different religions. The problem we all have, and it's not that new, is with the trustworthiness. We're moving into an age which, ironically, ironically, as a result of the media confusion that comes from the internet, actually encourages fake news, the post-fact society, echo chambers, everyone only listening to the like-minded, so that you know, there are particular problems relating to the Indian media, but it's also uh, a, 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 a broader problem. Really. So, do you think trustworthiness is possible without going to Well, I talked to Justice Kachu, who, amongst many other interesting <laughs> things in his life, was chair of the press council. And so I know his robust and interesting views on this subject. Um, as you know, it's a great controversy in Britain at the moment, the question of self-regulation. Um, um, I think you have to be very careful indeed when you allow the executive, the government, to, uh, to control regulation directly. So that I think independent self-regulation with a statutory underpinning but assuring the independence of the regulating bodies is about the best you can do. But that will not work unless you have some ethos of good journalism. If you have absolutely shameless, shrieking, uh, invasive of privacy, uh, sensationalist, um, celebrity, ob and cricket-obsessed journalism, then all the regulation in the world, where can I possibly be talking about? Um, I, then all the regulation in the world um, won't help you. So that I think it also has to be an answer. Actually, it's two things. One, there has to be a business model for good journalism. And two, there has to be an ethos of good journalism. And only when you have all those pieces have you got the trustworthy. I think perhaps we could have replaced all those adjectives with Indian. <laughs> and that would have <laughs> uh, so, Gautam, do you think um, as in it is possible without, so since we are discussing the media, as in do you think um, some kind of, as in this seems almost a bit like the ideal solution, as in have an independent self-regulator who has sufficient statutory powers to ensure that orders are followed, unlike say the BCB, C and the NBSA that we have, which are self-regulators uh, and not a statutory regulator. So do you think that that happy mean is possible in India and, 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 and uh, something that you would advocate as perhaps a step forward for free speech? I think it would depend entirely on how you structure this body because you would immediately run into a, a, a bunch of legal issues with respect to the jurisdiction and, and the powers. And specifically now uh, when uh, 
um, and so for example, would you have the body and then appeal to a tribunal after that? Yeah. And then do you go to the Supreme Court? Or, you know, so I, I think those issues have to be worked out before you can even think about whether it's feasible or not. So I, I don't think it's possible to think about, at least in India, a regulator in the abstract without first answering the questions of how you're going to set it up, what the appeal procedures are, and, and what its connection with the judiciary. Can I just jump in there because actually you would do well to read the report by Lord Justice Leveson yeah, yeah. because he actually shows just how difficult it is to do that balancing act. Can I say a word about the function of courts and Jeremy Waldron because I think that's a very interesting point. Two things. Number one, there is a phenomenon of populism, illiberal or anti-liberal populism going around the world in many different places and one of its characteristics is the attack on the other power. So there was a great example which many of you will have heard of when after the um, High Court in London ruled that the Article 50 vote on Brexit had to be taken to, uh, uh, activating Article 50 had to be taken to Parliament. The Daily Mail had a picture of the three judges looking like slightly ridiculous pink-faced middle-aged men in their wigs and as well as personal attacks on the judges in the copy, it had a banner headline, enemies of the people. And this is a classic populist statement. So what I hear in what you're saying is watch out courts because if you become too much, too activist in the way you're describing, then you get the populist counterattack. The second thing is, I, Jeremy Waldron is a great dear friend of mine, a huge admirer of his work. I thoroughly disagree with his book, The Harm of Hate Speech, <laughs> as do many because I think it's a really slippery slope if you move from the clearly defined harms of what I call dangerous speech to what he calls the dignitarian harms of hate speech, which are quite difficult to define, uh, and the analogy with pollution, as if all offensive speech is analogous with pollution. This means you're trying to regulate by law, potentially by criminal law, I mean, vast areas of speech, whole oceans of speech, and I think it is hugely problematic. And what it's asking the courts to do, and I'd love to hear you on this, and both of you, is to be kind of moral tutors, to set the tone for society, the expressive function of law. And I think that is, personally, I think it's deeply problematic. I think that these norms of robust civility are very important but I think we should in try to enforce and promote them by other means and not try to get the courts to do the work for us. And let me just add, I think and I, in the book I look at length at the record of hate speech laws in Europe where they've been used for 50, 50 years. It's not a very good record. If the purpose of hate speech laws, as one very distinguished French lawyer, Roger Herrera, said, is to enforce civility, they haven't done a great job. Right. I think that's as that's 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 quite a statement, uh, especially. And I think the just thinking about the that headline, enemies of the people, and that perhaps gets us into another debate of whether we'll ever see a headline like that in India because of contempt powers that yeah. are exercised by the courts. That's another great restriction on speech. But in the interest of time, we had invited some questions uh, from the audience before, and we will again, but there, since someone has taken the trouble of sending some questions, uh, so there, there are a couple which I think essentially can be summarized into one, which is um, how do we conceptualize the right to free speech where censorship is not always driven by the state, but driven by other members of the citizenry, as in something that we've seen recently in India, Wendy Doniger's book, uh, not no censorship, overt censorship by the state, but but by sort of some horizontal effect amongst the citizenry. And sort of linked to that was a question is, does the left or the centrists in India have a right to hijack the liberal agenda, specifically in the context of a protest against a right-wing ideologue speech at a literature fest recently? Is that acceptable? Now, I think broadly the question seems to be, where is, is there a kind of free speech fundamentalism uh, that might be present, as I'm trying to summarize. And if, uh, and, and that's one, and two is, uh, what, how do we conceptualize threats to free speech from other members of the citizenry? Perhaps Gautam, you'd like to take some of that? Um, as far as conceptualizing threats from other members of the citizenry goes, I think it's a very straightforward answer, an effective and accountable uh, police force that follows follows the law when it's investigating 
uh, alleg alleged offenses in terms of filing the FIR, investigating, not arresting, and so on, and trial courts that actually uh, work well in the, in the sense that if there is a, a criminal case, then you have a swift hearing, swift arguments on charge, and if the charge is not made out, then discharge the accused of the state or at, at that position, right? so you don't have to go through a full trial. So I think with respect to um, private persons using physical threats or coercion, the answer is, as I said, an effective police force, and when private persons use the law, the mechanism of the law, then the answer is uh, an effective judiciary. So I don't think there's really a, a complex or subtle issue over there. Uh, with regard to left wing, I didn't understand that, so I, I don't know how to answer it. I mean, I, I just didn't understand it, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. it's a question, so I thought in the interests yeah. of free speech, we must, yeah. we must yeah. articulate the question as it was asked. Uh, but, um, Timothy, as in, it sort of links with the principle that you have, which is, and the part that you mentioned, that we must not accept violent intimidation. And it strikes me as something that's fairly obvious, that we must not. But perhaps in contradistinction, contradistinction to what Gautam said, as in perhaps the issue as isn't as simple, as in if, say, for example, you take the Perumal Murugan case, as in if your life is actually under threat, as in, I guess it's easy for us to sit here and say that perhaps we should not accept that violent intimidation and should go ahead and speak. But uh, isn't the issue a little more subtle? What you should never do is blame the murdered rather than the murderer. Uh, and so the very uh, unfortunate tendency which I think one sees in in India to some extent, but also very much in Europe, is, um, is that the heckler's veto or even the assassin's <coughs> veto prevails. And the police, and it's very often the police rather than the courts, come along and say, you better not do that, you better take that play off, you better not show that film, and so on and so forth. There is actually, and I think some of you will know this, I didn't, but there's a classic instance in English law which is a case, do you know this case? In 1882, in the English seaside town of Weston Super Mare, which was quoted by Stephen Sedley, who's a great English liberal judge, uh, in, in a judgment he made. What happened was, you know, the Salvation Army, well, the Salvation Army was marching down the street singing, you know, onward Christian soldiers and doing what the Salvation Army does. And believe it or not, there was something called the Skeleton Army. Um, whose um, delight it was to beat up the Salvation Army. The police arrested leaders of the Salvation Army who were convicted of a breach of the peace, by the way, a very English idea which you've inherited, I'm afraid, in full measure. And a higher court reversed and said, look, you've got to go after the guys who were causing the problem and threatening the violence go after the skeleton army, not the salvation army. And I generalize this to a general principle for, as it were, all of us, which is take a look at any given situation and say who's the skeleton army and who's the salvation army and go after the skeleton army. But all too often, the police in particular in many, many countries are shutting up the salvation army rather than the skeleton army. I think that's true, as in most certainly in India, it's almost by inaction yeah. as in that, that, that we have this. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. I'm sure there might be a few. Uh, so we've got about, uh, say, 20 minutes. Um, so if you could just introduce yourself and keep the questions uh, short. Yeah, we've got two here. Maybe we'll take a two or three and then take them together. Do we start here? Yes. Can you speak into the mic? Uh, I am Mujibur Rahman. I teach at Jami University. Uh, my question is, uh, my concerns or interest in the question of free speech is what free speech does to democracy or what democracy should do in order to uh, realize the complete potential of free speech. Uh, in the discussion, uh, two major institutions who come out, one is judiciary and the media. Uh, in my understanding, political parties could play a very important role. and. Uh, uh, there are a lot of scholars like Amartya who makes profound statement on democracy without ever mentioning what political parties, uh, which I think is a serious shortcoming in the interpretation of democracy as such. Uh, I just want to give two quick examples on Indian case. Uh, one is the case of our Prime Minister Modi. During campaign, Prime Minister Modi made a very profound statement, said that this is a country which will be governed by one constitution and one book. 
and the same prime minister during the campaign in the history of modern India made the most unprecedented attack on the idea of secularism virtually in, in every nook and corner of the country. Uh, so obviously his interpretation of constitution is very different and understanding of it. Uh, the other example would be Asaduddin Oasis, and who's also a lawyer and a political figure, and uh, his statement concerning Bharat Mata. So how do, how does kind of one could reconcile when prominent political figures have a very different interpretations, which is essentially <laughs> contradictory, and uh, where does it lead to? Thank you. Yeah, I'm K. Mahesh, I'm Special Secretary Home, and the topic uh, which you are discussing is India's role in global struggle over free speech as if we are a model and we can lead the world. First, we need to put our own house in order. I just want to ask Mr. Gautam Bhatia, and uh, <laughs> Professor talked about four effective uh, four effective uh, forces. Now, can you, in this country, can you have free speech without regulating the banning of the NGOs? In India, we are banning NGOs who have done credible work. So can you have free speech in the country by banning the NGOs, which, which enjoy high credibility and doing good work in promoting human rights? Thank you. We can take what, should we? Can we take one more question? Yes, there's a question here. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, the, the fascinating um, uh, discussion. Um, my question is to Professor, uh, uh, Professor Ash. Uh, now, uh, when you were stating your uh, principles um, uh, it, uh, uh, in a weird way, it, uh, it was uh, something similar to what you know, Dan and Saraswati used to say about going back to Vedas. It seemed like uh, going back to John Stuart Mill and uh, uh, so so uh, so it uh, s seemed uh, an interpretation of uh, of mills harm principle and um, uh, and the crucial um, uh, point over there would be how do we define harm and um, uh, uh, and uh, and there uh, I, I thought uh, one of the um, argument or uh, view that you encountered when your uh, interactions with indian mps uh, uh, about um, you know, uh, separating a believer from the belief. Um, and then we look at uh, the whole uh, tradition of communitarianism, et cetera, and uh, someone like uh, um, uh, uh, Charles Taylor uh, uh, talks about sources of self and, 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 and thinks that that belief um, um, is an important uh, uh, maker of self. Um, so, uh, so, so what, how do you define the harm in the context of separating belief from believer? Right, yeah, so on the on the banning of NGOs, yes, it's of course a, a pressing issue presently, and I think there the problem is that the laws that allow for, for instance, uh, cutting off the funding that NGOs receive from foreign sources are are worded in a in a very broad manner. First of all, and secondly, I think more importantly, um, they allow the the government to have the first. Uh, short, so the government will will take action, and then it's for the NGO to to go to court and try to fight it. Now, I think that's an issue that can be resolved by a structural change, which is that if the government wants to ban an NGO or if it wants to say cut off its funding, then it first has to go to court in adversarial proceedings, convince the court that there is a case to be made out under law for doing that, when where the NGO has a chance to present its case, and if the court decides in the government's favor, then only can can the ban or the choking off of funds actually take place. So that actually uh, increases the costs upon the government. It requires the government to actually uh, take the initiative and, and, and go to court and, play and takes the burden off the speaker. So I think structural changes can actually help uh, in ensuring that, that these issues uh, become a little more uh, slanted towards, uh, towards free speech. And secondly, on the issue of uh, political figures having different interpretation of the constitution, I think that's I think it's perfectly fine. I think that's the point of a democracy where different people interpret the constitutional mandate in different ways. And and I think here, in fact, uh, this is a classic case of answering speech by more speech, where if you disagree with, with Modi's interpretation of what secularism means, then the answer is to provide an alternative view that's more persuasive. So I think, I think that's a very straightforward case of, of speech versus speech. There's no like deeper issue over there, in my view. Um, so. There's something called the Reduced Shakespeare Company, which performs all the plays of, 
uh, William Shakespeare in two hours, and, I, and this has been a sort of a kind of reduced Shakespeare company because this is 10 years' work and 500 pages. So I do urge you, please, to go and have a look at the website because there's a lot of discussion, and if you can, get the book, because obviously these are very complex issues. I do think there are worse things than to go back to John Stuart Mill and look at the harm principle in a contemporary context and to explore the distinction between harm and offense, which is obviously the crucial distinction, in a sophisticated way. So the, the mere fact of, of having found common ground in that framing of the question is itself already enormous progress. And then you're welcome to come back on the issue, for example, of belief and believer um, with a different interpretation of the harm, as, as Jeremy Waldron had done. I mean, we'd have made huge progress if we, if we had common ground for having the debate. Uh, on democracy and free speech, um, you know, you can have the kind of democracy which doesn't give you free speech, but you can also have the kind of free speech which doesn't give you democracy, right? There are both problems. There are certain ways in which a democracy, which is a somewhat illiberal democracy, can function, which actually threaten free speech. But what we're having too much of in the West at the moment, and I referred to this in my mention of post-fact society and echo chambers, is that we no longer have the kind of free speech that we need for a well-functioning democracy. What was the basic idea? The basic idea was in 5th century BC Athens, all the citizens get together in one forum. Anyone can speak. All views, opinions are heard. Everyone can put their evidence on the table. And then you decide to fight the invading Persians at sea and not on land. And that's how the Athenians won the Battle of Salamis and defeated the invading Persians. And therefore, the world's first democracy was actually saved by free speech by debate. That's what you need for democracy. Now, if you look at what we have in our fragmented modern media landscapes, you have the liberal echo chamber, which is all for Hillary Clinton, and the Republican echo chamber, which is all for Donald Trump. And you were quite far away, all the Brexit echo, echo chamber and the Remain echo chamber. So we have a real, real problem in that we're ceasing because of the evolution of media for multiple reasons, technological and commercial as well as other ideological, to cease to have the media that we need for, 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 for democracy. Last point on India, I mean, far be it me, from me to say, I don't think it's entirely true to say that India can only lead by example. I mean, for example, on internet governance, actually India has the potential to be a really significant player as a state, as a government. But by and large, I think you're right. And since we seem to be losing one city upon a hill in Washington, perhaps you can try and be the new city on a hill. I think we can take a, another round of questions. There's one there, one there, and one there. We'll take a third. Yeah, can we start there? Yeah. Okay, Son. Um, I wanted to ask more about your thoughts on both legal approaches and approaches outside the law on the question of the offender's veto. Um, particularly in relation to religious sentiments. So on one hand, it seems easy to dismiss um, sort of legal sanctions on statements offending religious sentiments, mostly because we've sort of seen fairly absurd examples of this. On the other, however, there's also a lot of scholarship, especially within post-colonial religious studies, that talks about how, say in the context of the Danish cartoons, it was impossible for the European sort of courts to truly recognize Muslim injury act the cartoons because the very secular and by secular, they argue that you mostly mean Protestant structures underlying what you understand as free speech is also based on Protestant semiotics, right? So certain understandings of images and certain understandings that, look, it was a cartoon. It was an image. It wasn't actually Prophet Muhammad himself. And so how is it? And so scholars have argued that you cannot accommodate this within secular law because your secular law itself comes from a different place. So then how is it that we think of accommodating, you know, whether legal or outside legal? these things when you know we're coming from a certain sort of legacy to where the law is second if we agree that there is a need to protect the sentiments of say certain minority religious groups how do we make sure that in offering that protection we're also cognizant of the differences that exist within groups so what if something offends the men in a religious group and not the women are the men sort of not entitled to that uh, you know being a just um, judge under standard of sort of progressive gender norms um, or something else 
Yeah, hi. So my question is basically regarding the practice of free speech by the Supreme Court and about internet governance. Um, I take the prime example of a case that's pending in the Supreme Court before a certain judge who is not very, uh, who's quite known for his judicial overreach, which makes it even more worrisome. So the case is basically against the private superpowers, as you call them, Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft, for uh, how they sell gender determination kits on uh, their uh, websites. So there's a law in place, a problem very unique to India of um, you know fetal, fetal determination and they're killing female feticide. So there's a law in place which basically says that you can't have advertisements or images that promote these uh, gender determ determination kits. So the petition of the Supreme Court is basically asking for the banning of these links or advertisements of these on the, on the websites. So while you can't question the morality behind these petitions, that is basically you're saying that on the smartphone, by, by paying, let's say, 200 rupees, you don't get a gender de determination kit. But while the effect of it on free speech or on internet governance is very worrisome. So basically my question is, when there are these petitions in court, how do you work around these cases where you can't question the morality behind the banning, so to speak, of these things, while the larger effect of this on free speech itself is worrisome. How do you work around this? There's a question there. <coughs> uh, my question is very simple. Given your views on freedom of speech, do you see any restrictions at all as necessary for the success of a government? Uh, I can start here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Would yeah. you like to say something, Mr. Sorabji? On Okay. Could you repeat your question? Speak into the mic if you can. The mic's not working. Okay, then it's louder. Very simply, do reasonable restrictions at all seem necessary to the, on the freedom of speech for the success of a government? Are reasonable restrictions necessary for the success of a government? Sorry, I'll, I'll need to like ask a clarificatory question. What, yeah. what exactly do you mean by the success of a government? Could you just define that? Uh, what um, you <laughs> <laughs> the, of, the success of a policy of a government. Are there some restrictions? Right. You said that sedition or defamation, etc., etc., are part of the colonial structure of Indian laws and should be struck down. But do you, do you feel that there are any restrictions at all which are necessary to safeguard the current political structure? Uh, right, okay. Let's understand that as law and order. Right, yeah, okay, okay, got it. Should I start or? Yeah, yeah. You, you why don't you go? You start. Yeah, no, so I think there is an existing test with regard to um, restrictions on speech in the interests of, say, public order and law and order. And that's the so-called Brandenburg test of incitement to imminent lawless action. Right? So, and that's the test the Supreme Court, again, Justice Karju, uh, accepted in a case called Arup Bhuyan, where he said that um, uh, you can only uh, punish, uh, in this case, it was a question about un being an unlawful mem member of an unlawful organization. And he said that only when it rises to the level of incitement to violence can you restrict speech. And, and the underlying logic behind that is that um, anything short of, of incitement uh, you have to actually respect both the speaker and the listener. The speaker is the one who communicates the message, and the listener is somebody who, as an autonomous person, decides for herself what to make of it. So, unless you have a situation like shouting fire in a crowded theater, you know, the old chestnut, or inciting an already enraged mob to violence, you have to stop at that. That's your threshold, right? So, I, and I, I, it's a difficult uh, test. I, it's not a clear question, but I tend to agree with that possible test that we have. Right? Uh, on the issue of um, the sex determination case for the Supreme Court, so I think that's a great example of um, the limits of the judiciary in, in enforcing laws. So what's happened in that case is that this judge has basically invented this doctrine of auto block, where he's you know, uh, asked um, the search engines and, uh, and intermediaries to basically like on the basis of certain keywords to, to block websites and, and that, and you can, you can imagine uh, what kind of problems that will cause, right? And then this is an old objection to, uh, you know, uh, judicial, uh, uh, to, to judges ruling over multi-pronged disputes. Lawn Fuller makes that dispute, uh, 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 objection where he says that polycentric disputes, which, where you, you rule on one issue and you'll have a, a wide variety of, of things that get affected, right? So, and I think it's a good example of why uh, the, the judiciary should kind of stand back and, and say, okay, we agree that it's, it's, it's immoral. But ultimately, it's too complex an issue. We don't have the resources to deal with it. So it has to be left to the executive and the parliament. That, that's my view, and I, I could be wrong on that. Um, on the issue of, yeah, is there a need to protect sentiments within a group? So I think I wouldn't frame it as protecting sentiments at all. I don't think that 
sentiments have any right to protection. I think uh, the debate has to be shifted to um, uh, what I say would be more an equality-centered view, which is that uh, certain kinds of speech and speech acts, as I said earlier, uh, form part of a network of a set of practices that uh, are, sub uh, are subordinating and are, are unequal. So the example again is that uh, a whites only sign in an apartheid state is not just a speech act, it's also part of a of a set of practices that are inherently unequal. So I think that um, uh, I, I would shift the debate to that to that vocabulary and I think the, the Supreme Courts of Canada and South Africa have done a good job in my view of, of distinguishing between uh, sentiment and, and hurt feelings on the one hand uh, and speech that actually contributes to maintaining uh, an unequal power relation, right? So, so I, I, would, I would frame it in that way. So, I mean, obviously the whole debate about free speech is about what are reasonable restrictions. We all know that. But on the Brandenburg test, so just, I'm sure you all know this, the Brandenburg test is that on incitement to violence is it has to be intended, likely, and imminent a three-part test, okay? So I argue in the book that the Brandenburg test needs to be modernized because of the nature of the internet. Because the nature, the fundamental nature of the internet is that it telescopes both time and space. What is imminent on the internet when on the internet everything is immanent? Something that is posted in China, 20 years ago is still there and can still act as incitement. And I think in that light and also in the light of what we know about genocides, and this starts going to the question from over here, um, we know that absolutely systematic, sustained incitement to murder particular groups who are described as animals, as cockroaches, can act as incitement to violence, so the Rohingya in Myanmar would be a great example of that. There were pages on uh, the Bahed Kala Gang, you know, pages on Facebook up there for ages, not to mention Rwanda. So I think it has to be modernized. You have, as it were, to slightly go slightly farther up the food chain of violence, if I can put it that way. Now, this connects to the question about uh, offended religious feelings. I, it was a lady here, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, Protestant semiotics, I like that, yes, yeah. I, I, I completely get where you're coming from. Um, and there are two separate issues here that are obviously related. One is, even if you felt that was the right thing to do, should you do it by law, and in particular by criminal law, given the mass of stuff that you then have to judge? I think the answer to that is no, and particularly not formulating it as offending religious feelings, which is what is done in Putin's Russia. And that's what Pussy Riot were convicted for, and that the record of that is not good. But if you then take it as I want to, into the very large realm of civil society, of my second free speech question, how should free speech be, then I think that becomes a very important insight, which we in Western societies have to be more aware of. You have to have the knowledge and the sensibility to understand. So let me give you a quick example. Do you remember after the Charlie Hebdo murders, um, the, the, the motto was, Je suis Charlie? I have many European Muslim friends who say, I simply could not bring myself to repeat the hashtag Je suis Charlie because these, offen these cartoons were just so profoundly offensive to me. I understand that very well. In the normal course of events, I would never have republished those cartoons. Not in The Guardian, not in The New York Times, not anywhere. In the very, very special circumstance in which the journalists of Charlie Hebdo have been brutally murdered simply for publishing it, the act of republication, or Je suis Charlie, becomes a different statement. It acquires a completely different meaning. It is, we will not accept violent intimidation. We will defy the assassin's veto. And is, I think, to be understood as such. But, but I think it, it is a difficult line to walk. And I think, but I think that line should be walked by us in civil society and not ask the courts to do it. Um, we have time for a last round of quick questions. Uh, please introduce yourself and keep it very brief because we are completely out of time. We'll take one, two, three, and four. I'm sorry, we just don't have any more time. Yeah, can we start here? So, um, since you said uh, you're a historian, I want to ask you about, um, can you place the current popular 
a populist um, backlash in a historical context. It seems like you know we've been moving in a very liberal direction. Now you have the majority who get offended at every little thing, you know, um, and, and, and it's like, oh, why is that minority getting special treatment? And do you think that this is just a period of them lashing out and then we'll go back to, you know, it's the historical trend going in a certain way? And um, I uh, publish a, a news site. Um, I made a conscious decision to base the company outside of India so that I don't have to deal with all this free speech shit, you know, just like, you can't come after me, it's not in your country. So, um, <clears throat> and, and, and the idea of self-regulation is abhorrent to me. I mean, I don't want any, there should be clear laws, there should be clear direction from the Supreme Court on the interpretation of the laws, but I don't want another intermediating body telling me, you know, what I can and cannot publish. Okay. Can I just ask, is your new site, it's not, it's freely available in India, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pranam, I am Akash. I am a Swatantra Tantranshav Yantra. In the past few years, Facebook has been able to do free basic work with free basic work in the country, which has been stopped by any way. And some PIL was also in this case. But in the past few years, I have never said that the Supreme Court or any other court has been able to do this. Airtel or Facebook has been able to do this. But they have been able to do this. ये कह करके इसको लागू कराया कि ये देश के हर व्यक्ति को बोलने की स्वतंत्रता प्रदान करेगा जबकि वो एकदम उल्टी बात थी तो देश का मतलब जो बोलने की स्वतंत्रता है उसको रोकने पर भी मतलब उन्होंने इतना बड़ा गुनाह किया लेकिन फिर भी किसी कोर्ट ने या किसी न्यायालय ने इसको गुनाह क्यों नहीं माना या इसके खिलाफ ऐसी पी क्यों दायर नहीं हुई जो कि सच में काम करती जबकि जॉली एल और इन जैसों के ऊपर तो पी दायर होती है धन्यवाद uh, n namaste, sir. Uh, my question is to Mr. Gautam. Uh, well, sir, uh, fr from my observation, what I've seen is with respect to when any law is being passed in India, we see there are so many consultation papers and uh, civil society NGOs give their opinions and then the, maybe the law commission gives its recommendations and Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha. I see that there's a fair amount of debate with respect to when a law could be passed and finally if the centre doesn't like it, it goes ahead and passes an ordinance. Well, sir, uh, uh, my question is, sir, in all this process, when sometimes things just go down the drain and it doesn't get passed, a poor Indian villager is somewhere affected by all this. So with so much of free debate, and that poor man doesn't get what he wants. So my, my question is, if there was a villager from my own village, what could he take home from this debate, sir? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know how much relevant is my question, but... Oh, okay, okay. It, it will be short. <laughs> uh, just I wanted to ask that uh, uh, I am a law graduate and if I have been allowed to educate myself and obtain a degree in LLB in Hindi medium, but I am not allowed to speak uh, and uh, articulate my arguments in Hindi in Supreme Court because the language is English. So can we say the, that it is a reasonable restriction uh, on my <laughs> free speech? So. <laughs> Narayan came to Supreme Court and he told the court, I will be in Hindi. His dad told her, take them very well, do it. But the judge to my left and that to my right, the point of this, the word of the judge said. Then Rath Narayan took it. The thing is, what I feel is, actually, there can't be absolute freedom of speech. There have to be restrictions. But they must be very narrowly drawn. And those who are and there will be different mindsets. One person, one Supreme Court term, sit a bank. Different benches have different mindsets. Look at the <laughs> judgment of Justice Singhvi, or Section 377, homosexuality. So really, it's a feeling of tolerance. We don't have a spirit of tolerance. You remember uh, Timothy? Uh, Truman was very angry because his, wife, his uh, daughter's piano <laughs> performance was criticized. He said, I'll punch that critic in the nose great American judge, uh, president. So actually we must develop a temperament that there is freedom for the thought we hate, freedom for views we don't accept, and that is how we can get on.
So, so with respect to, uh, I mean, the question of what a person from a village might take from this debate, I think I can do no better than take the example Amartya Sen gave about the inextricable connection between uh, civil and political rights uh, and uh, social economic rights. And he takes the example of a famine, and he says that without open channels of communication, without a strong free speech right where you can actually communicate information about the famine, its consequences will be much, uh, much more severe. So I think that, um, this, of course, it's a very valid point to say that uh, for many people in the country, access to the infrastructure of speech is off limits, and therefore, they, in any meaningful way, they cannot exercise the right to free speech. I agree with that. At the same time, I think the right to free speech is not simply about speaking, but also about a range of other issues, including access to information and a strong free speech right also ensures that you have that uh, what Amartya Sen argues as well. So, I th so that's what I'd, I'd say to that. Um, on the language of the quotes being in Hindi, no, I mean, I, I, of course, I completely agree that uh, English is, is exclusionary. The fact that we're having this discussion in English is itself uh, exclusionary. There's, there's no doubt about that. The problem with Hindi is that if you, if you make it Hindi, then, then, you know, there are other language issues. So why Hindi? Why not any of the other languages in India, right? And as I understand it, the reason why Eng English has become uh, the default language of governance is the, is the modus vivendi, right? So it's, it's the only language which, to an extent, can be uncontroversial, right? And, and, and it's, of course, it's not satisfactory, but I, I don't see what the solution can be. If you make Hindi the official language, people will have legitimate grievances with that as well. You know? so, so I don't know what the answer is there. Um, on, um, on, on free basics, job ka sawal tha, ye court tak isliye nahi pahuncha kyunki iske isse pehle ki ye court tak pahunch paya uh, try ne ek uh, uh, try ne keh diya ki ye iski anumati nahi hai bharat mein to isliye court tak pahunchne ka mauka mila hi nahi usko uh, to uh, to say it in english uh, the gentleman's question was that um, uh, why uh, did the issue of free basics not reach the court and uh, to which uh, the answer is that um, before it could become a legal issue it was resolved politically when when try basically passed an order uh, saying that you know free basics in its present form could not be allowed. So that's why it never got a chance to actually become a legal or a constitutional issue. Well, this has been utterly fascinating. I mean, first of all, to the question about your poor villager, this is a gentleman who I met on the plane from Jaipur uh, two days ago. So delighted to see you here. And I think it is a very good question that one should ask oneself. Um, and I do think, you know, the famous Amartya Sen argument makes the point that actually for the, for the very poor in developing countries it's often freedom of information which is the key more than freedom of expression. Now of course if you have no freedom of expression freedom of information is useless because you can't access it, you can't publish it, but nonetheless but freedom of information is, is key. On the language question, I was wonderful that this then broke into Hindi. My Hindi is a little rusty, I have to say. Um, it is, it, it's an interesting point which I make in the book that the effect of the internet is in some significant degree to break down political state frontiers. So if you look at Wikipedia, all English language speakers in the world are united in one English language Wikipedia. There's an English language wiki nation. The Portuguese are united in, uh, Portuguese speakers are united, and so the Brazilians argue with the Portuguese about which is the better Portuguese, and the Brazilians win because there are more of them. But in other words, the state frontiers have broken down, but the linguistic frontiers are remarkably stubborn and resistant. And there have been studies, because Wikipedia is a great, you know, case study for this, even between English and German Wikipedia, it's amazing how, many, how much difference there is in the concepts covered. I think it's roughly half the concepts covered in English Wikipedia are not covered in the German. So language is, in a way, the last barrier of the internet. Thirdly, a populist backla backlash, if you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll refer you to my essay in the latest New York Review of Books, which attempts to analyze that, because I want to pick up your point about the news site. You, you said as if it was self-evident. You know, it's, of course, anyone in India can, can, can read it. If I were having this conversation in China, it wouldn't be self-evident at all. If I were having this conversation in Brazil, it would no longer be self-evident at all. That's to say, it is a key question whether a country like India asserts its information sovereignty through rigorous control of the Internet, or, and this goes to the question about Yahoo, follows the German example, which I think is a very good one. So, Germany for understandable reasons because of its history, criminalizes Holocaust denial and Nazi insignia. 
But if you are sitting in Germany, you cannot see this stuff on google.de, i.e. the German site of Google. But all you need to do is to type in google.com slash ncr, and hey presto, you're in the United States, and you can see this stuff with one click. Now, you might say the Federal Republic of Germany is being grossly inconsistent. If this is your norm, if this is a standard you wish to impose, you should impose it consistently. But Germany has said, yes, but the price of doing that is we would have to make the great firewall, not of China, the great firewall of Germany. We would have to build a new Berlin Wall on the Internet around our country. And this is a price we do not want to pay because we believe in Article 19. I think that's a very good and reasonable compromise, and I'm delighted to hear if, if India were, is, were consistently following that example. That's great, because then you can have those news, night, news site outside, and that's already a huge gain for free speech. Finally, to the great Soli Sarabji, of course, I totally agree with you. It's up to us, it's up to society, the spirit of tolerance, freedom for the thought we hate. And this is where I come back again to hate speech laws and to the problem with hate speech laws, is it doesn't allow people to develop that spirit by trial and error. And perhaps I can end with in urging you, please do visit the website and if you can afford it by the book, but, but above all the website, the, there's a, a kind of a, a, an image, a metaphor that goes through the whole book, which I found in the work of Michel Foucault, he has a great book called Fearless Speech, and he says that an Epicurean philosopher in ancient Greece said that free speech should be taught as a technique, as a skill, like navigation. So the ancient Greeks were great navigators, right? They, and, and we should learn free speech as we learn to sail on the high sea. But you can't learn if the state doesn't allow you to take the boat out because everything is forbidden. And I think that, you know, if there's one image to take away, it's that image of learning it as navigation by trial and error. And that's, I think, what we have to do if we want to have a free and open and mature society. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Oh. I think that's quite, a, quite an aspirational thought to leave with. Uh, and I think it's, there's, there's been plenty to think about, and I think there will be plenty more that we can discuss. Uh, I'm afraid we are out of time, so I know there were several questions that we could not take. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, we've got a small token of our appreciation for the speakers, Timothy uh, and Gautam. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they are unequal in size. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I think it's your own books gifted back to you. Uh, I hope not. But um, thank you, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we hope to have this every two months, and uh, please follow us on different forms of social media where we express ourselves for following us and the events. Thanks very much. Good night. <laughs>